ready? Check it, check. So we're down here asking the question, what does it mean for somebody to be a Christian? Uh, to me, it doesn't mean much. I think it means you believe in God and you go to church. It's something to believe in. Um, it means a strong sense of a bond with your family. He's still thinking, hold on. Well, that last guy looked kind of stoned to me. I don't know. I'm just uh, guessing here. People have got a lot of weird ideas about what Christianity means. And uh, we're starting today a series, a, a seven-week series, um, on this topic. We're calling it Beyond Belief. Because one of the major misconceptions that people have about Christianity, even a lot of Christians have about Christianity, is that it's primarily about believing certain things. You believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you believe in the Bible, boom. Um, it is about that, but it's about much, much more than that. It's about life, a new kind of life that God has ushered into the world through Jesus Christ. It's about the reign of God, the kingdom of God. It's about how we live, about being transformed in our life. And so this series is going to be looking at things that keep us locked in believism, that keep us from transitioning from what we believe to how we actually live. So we're calling it Life Beyond Belief. A life that goes beyond believism, but also a life that has the potential of being quite unbelievable. And as always, almost as always, we're going through the book of Luke, because uh, this is part of a decade study of this marvelous kingdom gospel. And so we're up to Luke chapter 11, and we're starting with verse 27. We're going to entitle this message, Get Real, because it's about entering into the reality of the kingdom, getting out of our merely theoretical beliefs or our spectator mindset and getting real, making the kingdom real in our life. And so it says this in Luke chapter 11. As Jesus, verse 27, as Jesus was saying these things, so just know there that Jesus is still talking about the stuff he's been talking about. But in the middle of it, a woman in the crowd called out, kind of a heckler. She interrupts Jesus. Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let's pray. Father, we pray for everybody in this auditorium and everybody who will be listening to this via podcast, that you would, God, open up our ears and open up our hearts to build your kingdom in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives and our bodies and our attitudes and our behaviors. Father, free us from anything in our life that we've absorbed from the culture that keeps us sort of outsiders looking in rather than insiders who are actually doing it. God, we're praying for major life changes in the hearts and minds of some people here this morning or whenever the folks are listening by podcast. Uh, and that, Holy Spirit, only you can do. Words can never do that. So we just relax in the sufficiency of your sovereign will using our words to change lives. And build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That just means I agree. That's what the word means. You may recall, if you've been here for a couple of months anyways, that about two months ago or so, we talked about Jesus delivering a man who had a mute demon. Remember that? Uh, this passage actually is part of that. It started with that guy being delivered of that mute demon. Back in verse 14. And that really amazed the crowds we saw a couple of uh, uh, months ago because it was believed in the first century that mute demons or demons that caused muteness were the hardest kinds to cast out of people. The reason was because they believed in the first century that you had to get a demon to identify itself in order to get its name to, to cast it out. And since mute demons don't talk, how are you going to get its name? But here comes Jesus, and he doesn't ask any questions, doesn't have to find out the name, rank, or serial number of this demon. He just casts the demon, demon out, and the people are wowed by it. Of course, the, the guardians of, of truth and righteousness in the first century, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're ticked off because Jesus is casting out demons, but he's not on their side. And so they accuse him of casting out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And then that leads Jesus to refute them. And then he goes on in giving a, a sort of a, a kingdom talk on spiritual warfare and how he came to tie up the strong man and yada, yada, yada. We've, we've been through that the last two months. Now, I bring that up for this reason. For us, it was roughly two months ago when we looked at Jesus casting this demon out of a guy and the crowd being amazed. But for the audience, 
that Jesus was speaking to, that was about five minutes ago. And I say that in order to explain why this woman became a heckler. Uh, she is still really excited about what she just saw. They're amazed, and now Jesus is giving this, this teaching. And so this woman just kind of caught up in the moment, hollers out, interrupts Jesus' teaching, and says, Blessed is your mother! Now, here's the thing. That, that eruption, if you will, wasn't really uh, uh, an eruption of worship and praise. She wasn't like acknowledging Jesus to be the Son of God. Uh, Jesus was okay when people uh, would fall down and worship him. He accepted that because he is, in fact, God incarnate. But this woman is doing something different. She is caught up in what I would call celebrity-itis. Celebrity-itis. Uh, she is wowed by this human being. In her perception, this is a human being who just is really cool. He rocks. He's doing incredible stuff. He's teaching incredible stuff. Wow. So he, she says, how lucky was your mom to raise you, to nurse you, to give birth to you? Celebrity-itis. Celebrity-itis is the result of us taking our, our impulse to worship, which every human being has because we're made to be worshipers. But when we don't direct it towards God, we end up directing it towards other people or sometimes towards other things. And this is what this, this, this woman is doing. In fact, it's, it's even clearer in the, the original Greek because she's not even really eulogizing Jesus' mother. She's eulogizing Jesus' mother's body parts. In the original Greek, she says... Blessed is the womb that gave birth to you, and blessed are the breasts that nursed you. The King James Version has, blessed are the paps which gave thee suck, which is one of the reasons why we don't use the King James Version around here. <laughs> paps. I remember as a new Christian, we had to read the King James Version, and I read that, and like, paps? But they have a faucet or something to use back then? I, I don't, you know. Anyways, moving along. Um, so she, she's really, and the word blessed there can simply mean, makarios in Greek means uh, happy or fortunate. So she's really just caught up in the moment. She's going, lucky womb, lucky breasts. You know, that they touched you. You're a celebrity. You're Mr. Wild Man. Celebrity-itis. Uh, probably the best expression of it. I mean, it's all over the place. But uh, the best expression probably is with, with, with teenagers. Um, when they, you know, get, when there's a pop icon, a uh, teen idol that catches their attention. My, my, my girls, when they were like 12 or 13 years old, um, Alicia, I don't know if you're here right now, but forgive me. Uh, but uh, when they were 12 or 13, they were really into new kids on the block. Remember the new kids on the block? They were, for about two years, they were the happening thing. Uh, th you know, they, they uh, had corny songs and corny dancing. Oh, 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 oh. The right stuff. Dun, 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 dun. And, and they always dance like this. The, the right. <laughs> the right stuff. The worst choreograph in the world. The, the, the choreography was terrible. Uh, but my girls love these guys. She, they had the posters. Uh, you know, they, they had the teeny bopper magazines. They talked about them a lot. They sang their songs. They'd make up dances to the new kids in the block. And they'd imitate their movements and doing the corny dance and things like that. Uh, they're just into them. One time I was walking downstairs, and they were playing, of course, some new kids in the block with some friends, playing some of their music. And I heard them talking about some contest that they had in one of these teeny bopper magazines, teen magazine or something, that if you ask, whoever gave the best answer to some question about one of the new kids on the block, or guessed something right, I don't know, uh, but they, they, you would get, a, uh, get, get to go to a concert for free, and you got to go backstage and meet Donnie or one of those guys. And these girls were just talking like, oh, my gosh. Can you imagine what it would like, so totally be like to, to just meet him? To, I mean, talk to him? I'd be, I'd be so nervous. I don't know what I'd do. I, I, and, and to touch him? And what if he winked at you? Oh, my gosh. I don't know what I'd do. And there's just like this total, you know, enraptured with these new kids on the block. That's celebrity-itis. And you wish that that was just true of 13-year-old girls. But in fact, uh, as we'll hear a little bit later on, uh, it, it characterizes a lot of people. And by the way, uh, this message is going to be a little different because I'm going to be doing tag team speaking with Scott, who's going to come up here in a moment. Uh, well, this is what Jesus is confronting in the first century. It's celebrity-itis. And he doesn't get mad at the woman. Uh, he gives her a gentle rebuke. She screams out, interrupts him by saying, Blessed is the womb of your mother. Blessed are the breasts of your mother. And Jesus 
kind of, he understands where she's coming from, but just says, you know what, not so much. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and who obey it. In other words, don't get caught up into my mother and start getting into that sort of, you're spectating, looking at me, being the wild man, but rather listen to what I'm saying and take great care to apply it to your life because the kingdom of not God is not about who impresses you and who wows your socks off. The kingdom of God is about hearing God's word and applying it to our life. So Scott, why don't you come up here and take it and uh, tell us why, in your opinion, we need to hear this message today. I'll do that as long as you don't dance like that again. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Or sing. Oh, oh great lyrics. That, that is, those are some great lyrics. You know, I, as we've thought about this and talked about it, we've realized that most people in our world today have a lot in common with this woman. She knew how to give people applause. She knew how to look up to people. And if there's anything that our world teaches us, it is that there are certain people in our culture that we want to know about, and the rest of us are just peons. Just visit your local grocery store, and there are those aisles that have the candy when you check out. And I avoid those because I like going down the aisle that has the interesting little magazines. And whether or not the covers on those magazines are true, and, or whether or not the pictures have been doctored and heads have been put on fat people and fat people have been put on skinny people or whatever, we don't really know. But it's just interesting stuff because everybody knows about those people. Everybody knows those names. In fact, we have a few pictures of some people here you'll, pro you'll recognize. Here's a, a picture of Oprah Winfrey. Oprah. Everybody knows Oprah. And if, if, if Oprah were to come to our church this morning, you'd want to sit in her section. Just admit it. I, I'd want to preach on tithing that day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And if Brittany were to come here, you might not like Brittany. You might think what she's done lately has been despicable, but most of us know what she's done lately because it's all over the news. It's just what our culture does. And then if Tiger were to come here this morning, exactly. We worship your Tiger. Yes, you know tiger. exactly what I'm talking about. And then there are those people that we know, but we don't know their names. This is a cast of Lost. Great show. This is a great show. Now, so you now Greg, you know all these characters. Uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, but do you yeah, know any yeah. of their real names? Nope, I don't know any of their real names. So if you were to see them in real life... You mean that that's not real? That's not really Jack and, and Hugo? And, no, I, no, I don't I'm know sorry. their names. No. I don't know how, and yeah. then there's the office, the office, which I like. You know, and the characters on The Office, and we, do we, we know Steve, Steve Carell. Carell. Yeah, Steve Carell and his name. In fact, we've taken this to a whole new level. Oh, great. Bobblehead dolls. So if we can't watch the show. That's Steve Carroll, by the way. This is Steve Carroll, world's best boss. You push this little button. Oh, it's not loud enough. Anyway, <laughs> it even talks to you. Sometimes so if you people feel rehearse distant, sermons before they actually if you, give them If you feel distant from Steve Carell. You can feel close to him if you just have his bobblehead doll. There you go. And then, of course, there's American Idol. Clay Aiken, anybody? Yes. We got bobblehead dolls. We got everything. We can worship our uh, people because we all want to be famous. So there's people in our culture that want to be famous, and there's those that we, we want to look up to that are, are admired. There are people, these are the people with the money, the people with the success. They have connections. They have opportunities. They have talent. And they get the attention. So those people, are, they, they have what most of us want. They get all this attention. They get all the publicity. And so if we can't have that, if we can't experience that aspect of life, we'll experience it through them. It's called vicarious living. They, they live, we live our lives through the popularity of other people. One example, I'll be a little bit transparent here, of, uh, this occurs in my life every fall on Sunday afternoon. I grew up in Texas, and the, when the Dallas Cowboys play, I have this vicarious living thing. I have this, I want to macho, I want to play football kind of thing that goes on in some men, and th that happens with me, and I can't play football, not to that level, or any level anymore. <laughs> so what do I do? I watch and I live through the Dallas Cowboys to the extent that if they lose, I'll get depressed. Now, does that make any sense whatsoever? That I don't is, own that any. That is really sad. It is that, really, that, sad. really sad. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. 
I, I don't own any stock in the Cowboys. I don't, I've never been to that Texas Stadium. I, I've, I've never experienced anything up close and personal or met a Dallas Cowboy. What difference would it make if I had? But if they win, wow, I'm on cloud nine. It was interesting watching uh, a few weeks ago when uh, uh, Brett Favre announced his retirement and the excitement that was happening here in Minneapolis and the utter depression that was happening in Green Bay. Yeah. Because... Somehow we are connected to these people and we live through them and, and we create these emotional connections with these idols in our culture. And we have to ask the question, has it, is there a possibility that this celebrity-itis has crept into the church? Is it possible that it's kind of come under the back door and it pervaded how we think about Christianity we, you've seen these posters that we have around uh, 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 talking about this series, Life Beyond Belief, that say, I believe in Jesus, but one of them we wrote said, I am just a Christian spectator. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the man, but I just watch. I go to church and watch. Because in our heart of hearts, we know or we think that there are people who do Christianity and though there are the rest of us who just think about Christianity, who just believe the right things about Christianity. Because there are certain people who can pray, and then there are the rest of us. Because who can pray like Greg Boyd? I mean, he prays for the people on the right and the left. I mean, who else can pray for people on the right and the left like Greg Boyd can? There you go. So... I can't pray like that. I got a that. PhD in right and left. I yes. just want you to know. Yeah, and this is right and this is left. And you need to remember. Yeah, sometimes it's the opposite. But, you know, who can do that? Oh, who, can, who can lead worship like Norm Blagman, our worship leader? And we, we become even critics of, oh, did, didn't Norm bring it? Didn't Norm just kind of bring down the house? He was prophetic this morning. He led us into worship. And I felt it. And it all becomes about... Well, is Norm on stage today? Aren't you thankful for, for Scott and how he led us this morning Amen. in worship? I was so... Woo! Not rocks. I'm thankful for Scott in that he is humble enough to come before the Lord that we all might enter into worship, not that he becomes the only worshiper in the room. Because it's not about Scott, it's not about Norm, it's not about Greg or anybody else that comes up on this stage. Because we are not to be critics of what happens up here. I, I, there was one speaker one time who, who said to me, or said in a speaking service, he, as people were leaving the service, uh, uh, he told us a story. How this woman came up to him and said, wow, you did a great job when you preached today. And he said, how did you do? Ooh. And they were like, what, how did I do? This was about you. You were the speaker. They didn't know how to respond. And that's so often what we do in the church is we, become, we make it about the man or the woman and how they're doing their thing. And, and we live vicariously through those who do the stuff on the stage. But this isn't the kingdom. The kingdom happens when we walk out those doors. This is a, a starting point for the kingdom. And we have to understand that, that this, the kingdom is much more than what happens on the stage or what happens on podcasting or what happens on TV. It's not about the person who's doing it or the person who says it right or the person who gets all the credit for it. Sometimes I think that when we get to heaven, we might be shocked as to who gets the most crowns. It might be that quiet little lady who just prayed quietly and served and served and served and served and never saw any attention in this life. Wow. Is it possible that Christianity is much bigger than what our celebrity itis will allow us to see? Is it possible that we need a new set of eyes to see what God has for us in this kingdom? And is it possible that we need to see how, per how pervasively this celebrity itis is stealing from us and hindering us from entering into the kingdom more fully? All right. Is it possible, Greg? Dude, that's preaching. I tell you, you're serving it up here. All right. I won't take that as a, I, I, a celebrity I say, thing. You know, I bow before you. You are doing so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I don't know if you saw. This is a, this is a classic expression of how uh, we as a culture are tending towards vicariously living through celebrity-itis. Um, there was a, uh, I saw the previews for Desperate Housewives this week. Um, some of you maybe caught this. And it's coming back on the air because it's been off the air for some time because of the writer's strike. And so finally it's coming back. And, and it showed some scenes from the upcoming episode. And then it had, as I recall, three slogans. Uh, it said, the first one was, start living. 
And then it said, start loving. And then it said, start laughing. Oh, that sounds so... You know, thank God that finally Desperate Housewives is coming back so we can start living again, folks. We can, we can start coming alive. We can start loving again. We can get joy back into our life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Desperate Housewives. Now, of course, it's ridiculous, absurd, insane uh, advertisement, but they didn't mean it as, as a comedy thing. I mean, it must touch some kind of a chord. And the reality is that to far too, to, to far too great an extent, uh, too many people... A good portion of their sense of being alive is what they're watching on television. The average person in America watches almost four hours of television a day. And, and what happens is by watching the news and, and getting into what the celebrity politicians are doing and by watching various soap operas maybe or these sitcoms or, or Lost or Office or what have you, uh, it gives us something to talk about, something to think about, something to look forward to. And, and we are kind of feeling more uh, alive because they're really doing life. And we're sort of sort of doing life by proxy as we're looking at them. Jacques Ellul, by the way, a famous a theologian, predicted a lot of this back in the 60s uh, in several books he wrote on technology, that the modern technology is going to create a culture of superstars where they are actually the ones doing the living where everyone else sort of just cheers them on and participates vicariously. Kind of what we do with, with football uh, teams. We think we're winning because they're winning. Now, th this isn't really a new phenomenon. I think it's, it, it's intensified and it's rampant in our culture, but, but it, it goes back a long ways. It was certainly there in Jesus' day. Uh, in, the, in the first century world that Jesus came into, uh, they had a class system of sort. Uh, they didn't have uh, movie stars, of course. Uh, they didn't have shows like Desperate Housewives. They had Desperate Housewives, but they weren't, there wasn't a movie about them. Um, but they had a, a, a tiered system, and so they had priests, and lawyers and Sadducees and, and other you know, dignitaries uh, in, in, in religious circles that were looked up to and eulogized. And Jesus isn't against those offices because, as a matter of fact, the office of priest and apostle and, or, or, or prophet and teacher, that comes out of the, out of the Old Testament. But what had happened in, in Jesus' day is that those, those roles had taken on a sort of valuation in the culture. They were, they were esteemed more highly than others, and these folks had become sort of celebrities. Uh, they were called by special names like rabbi, or holy father, or master teacher. And these were the folks that were seen as being the holy ones. They were revered. They did the religious stuff. And the job of everyone else is simply to get blessed by them, to get the holy crumbs that fall from the holy master's table, and to eulogize them and support them and, and sort of cheer them on. It was, it, it was a celebrity sort of phenomenon. Jesus, when he comes, he blows that whole mindset sky high. Listen to what he says in, in Matthew chapter 23. He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, these religious dignitaries, they sit in Moses' seat. Ooh, it's a high place of authority. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. When they walk in, everybody, they're the Oprah Winfrey's of the day. Everyone looks, ooh, look who's here, the teacher, the master, the rabbi. And they get the seat in the prestigious place, and they love that. They drink it up. They can feel all the eyes of the synagogue looking at them. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. Oh, yes, I'm the rabbi. But now listen to this. But you are not to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi. For you have only one master, and besides, you're all brothers. In other words, you're all equal. Don't be putting someone up on a pedestal by calling them rabbi. And do not call anyone on earth father. Not in a religious sense. Jesus himself called biological fathers fathers. That's fine. But don't pack that with religious significance. And the reason is because you have one father, and he is in heaven. God is your father. Jesus is confronting some huge stuff here. He isn't against authority. In fact, he establishes his 12 uh, apostles as having a leadership role in the movement that he was birthing uh, called the kingdom of God. So he's not against authority. And the whole New Testament talks about pastors and elders and preachers and apostles and prophets. And these are positions of authority. Uh, that's an okay thing. And Jesus is not against respecting those in authority and honoring and appreciating those in authority. In fact, sometimes Jesus commands it. That's fine. That's normal. But Jesus is completely against celebrityitis and completely against any kind of thinking that would, 
would lead people to believe that you were doing the kingdom by watching someone else, a celebrity, a specialist, a professional, do the kingdom. The celebrity-itis of the first century was reflected in titles like rabbi and father and master and teacher. It was a way of just sort of putting a person up on a pedestal. They're closer to God. It was a way of saying, you're closer to God than the rest of us. You're holier than the rest of us. You're more talented and famous than the rest of us. Your prayers count more than our prayers count. Your sacrifices count more than our, our sacrifices count. You are, you are kind of the mediators between God and the rest of us. And we little people, our job here is just to sort of go, yay, go. Blessed is your mother who birthed you and the breast that nursed you. Uh, you know, to just cheer you on. Because when you win, we win. And to be blessed by you and, and, and to support you, that's sort of our job. Our job is to make sure you do your job, because when you do your job, then we're all doing the job. Vicarious participation. And as Scott said, this is not something that we grew out of in the first century. It's very much present in Christianity today in a lot of different ways, a million different ways. Turn on your TV and watch some religious programming. You're going to see celebrity-itis. Whoa! What a golden tongue. And that guy pack a crowd. What an energy level he creates in this place or things of that sort. Or in some circles, it's uh, celebrity-itis is sort of uh, exemplified by the fact that they might call certain holy men father. And the father is, is the one who mediates God's presence to us and, 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 and mediates the sacraments and forgiveness and prayer to us. But in other religious circles, uh, you see something of celebrity-itis with titles like, my favorite is reverend. Reverend. Re reverend means one who is revered. I am a reverend, Scott. You are. I am a reverend. I have an R.E.V. And I revere you. My, yeah, yeah, don't. No, I am to be revered. Oh. You know, it, it, it's, a, you know, it, it sets a person apart. Now, I understand the R.E.V. in legal terms, you know, and for yada, yada, yada. That's fine. But, but as I read this text, tell me if I'm wrong later, uh, but it seems to me... <laughs> What is the difference between rabbi and reverend? I, it, it, you, do you take and you're picking, making a person, uh, putting them up on, a, on a pedestal. It's going beyond simply mere respect and appreciation. They're to be revered more than others. The, the term makes me nervous, and it makes people weird around you, too. Oh, you're a man of the cloth. I'm a man of God. And you've got to make sure you say God, but you say God just doesn't cut it. You've got to go God. I'm a man of God. You it have weird. to move your back like that, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, God. Where, where, do they, where, where do they get that kind of lingo? I think it comes from Texas. It probably does. God today. Okay, never mind. No, it weirds people out. People get weird around. They, they treat you differently. What's really weird is if you write a couple of books and it gets a little bit of media attention, New York Times, for example, people really start getting weird. Some people do. Not, 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 not you folks. But, uh, but there's a certain percentage of people who just get weird when your name is out there a little bit. Um, it's, it's almost as if, this is celebrity-itis, the more people who know you, the higher your stock goes. It's a weird, weird thing. And the people who know you don't even have to like you, because a lot of people who know me don't, or know about me don't like me, they don't agree with me, but the fact that my name is out there a little bit, I'm, I'm a peon by the total scheme of things, but still, you know, it's out there a little bit, but they, it, it weirds people out. They, they, they look at you a little different, they talk to you a little different, sometimes they get nervous around you, and, and the thing I wonder is this. What possible difference could it make in the universe whether three people know you or 30 million people know you? I don't get that one because you're still the same you. So whether three people know me or 30 million people know me, I guarantee you that I am as dumb and as forgetful and as stupid and sometimes as petty as I've ever been. I guarantee you that it's still the same me. And whether three people know me or 30 million people know, know me, I guarantee you that I still burp just like everybody else. I still flatulate, not as much as Scott, but I still do. Watch it. I, I, I have bowel movements like everybody else. My, my, my stomach still gurgles when I'm hungry. I get B.O. and I get bad breath and I snore loud when I sleep and that's not going to change. I don't care how many people know you. You see, the truth is we're all ordinary human beings with ordinary bodily functions, with ordinary, silly, fallible, often ignorant human stuff going on. And, and so there's no stock to be weighed against how many people know you or who don't know you. The, 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 the celebrity-itis thing is a total facade. And so Jesus comes along and he blows it all apart. Respect and admiration and words of appreciation are fine and wonderful. That's good. But celebrity-itis, whereby some person, for whatever reason, has a, has a, is, is ranked above and honored above others, is simply out of place in the kingdom. So Jesus comes and he says, knock it off. 
Knock it off. Don't go eulogizing my mom's breasts and my mom's womb. <laughs> and don't go eulogizing other people with fancy titles like rabbi, father, and reverend. Because the truth is, you're all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. You're all equal. You're all ordinary. You're all fallible. You're all sinners saved by grace. That levels the playing field right there. Levels the playing field. And so in the kingdom of God, there's no place for thinking one person is holier than another. There's no place for mediators between God and humans. No priests, no go-betweens, no celebrities, no reverends, no rabbis, no fathers. In the body of Christ, there's one father, and his name is God, the God of this universe. And we've got one Lord, one master, one high priest, and one go-between, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he doesn't need any competitors. Amen. It levels the playing field. Now, there, there's, there's, a, there's a place for different roles. That's appropriate. Some are called to lead, and most are called to follow. That's appropriate. Some are called to teach, and most are called to be taught. That's appropriate. Some are called to shepherd, and others are called to be sheep. That's appropriate. Some are called to write books, and others are called to read books. That's appropriate. But there's no justification for putting a valuation on that, like one's more important than anything else. We're all called to be ministers of the kingdom, all of us. We're all called to be doers and activists of the kingdom revolution. Different roles, yes, but not different doing. Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, so Christ, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, so that everyone could be wowed by how good they can talk and how good they can sing and how smart they are and how they can pack auditoriums. You should no, read that again. It doesn't say that. Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service, period. That's the total job description right there. So that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. The purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, authors, you name it, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's what we're doing here every weekend. It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The way that those folks do the kingdom, their unique call is to help others do the kingdom. But we're all called to do the kingdom. And if we stop and get caught up with thinking we're doing the kingdom by listening to, about how they talk about doing the kingdom, how good they can talk about doing the kingdom, how good they can sing about doing the kingdom or whatever, we're not doing the kingdom. We're totally missing the point. Bottom line is that every, anything I or anyone else says or writes or does, if it doesn't result in people drawing closer to Jesus Christ and getting more involved in kingdom activity, it's altogether worthless and it's altogether meaningless. I don't care how many people know you or don't know you. The kingdom isn't about who you admire, who you look up to, who you follow, or anything like that. It's about doing, getting involved, being transformed from the inside out, and pouring yourself out into kingdom activity. So, Scott, drive it home here in the last That's 10 right. minutes. That's right. You know, we could sit here and think, wow, didn't Greg just bring it? But what do we do about it? <laughs> what do we do about this? Because the title of this message is Get Real, not... Get better ears on your head so you can hear what Greg says. Or not get, get back in church so you can hear more sermons and become a better Christian, like was said in the, uh, in the video clip at the beginning where the guy said, what is a Christian? It's uh, believe the right stuff and go to church. But easy believism isn't what God has called us to. He has called us to a way of life. He has called us to a way of being that transforms our easy believism where we just think the right things. How do we move into this? Now, you might think, well, I don't know what to do, so we just walk away feeling guilty. I am a Christian spectator, and I just do the thing that I've, uh, that's all I've ever known to do, so I just feel guilty. What we want to do is say, hey, no, we want to give you some, a tool or some steps to say, let's move out of this way of thinking about Jesus and move this into our lives. One of the things that G uh, Jesus was saying to this woman was, blessed are those who hear and do who hear and obey, who hear and participate in my kingdom thing. Hearing it, hearing Jesus is really crucial to the obedience part. We're not, in other words, we're not, Jesus isn't just saying, I want you to all become iRobots or machines who just go about doing stuff just because you think it's a good idea. He's saying, hear me. Enjoy the, my, commune with me, enjoy a relationship with me, enter into a relationship with me, and out of that, obey me. And I, today, I, we want to introduce a way of entering into that uh, hearing and obeying 
that will carry us through this six weeks and hopefully will become a new pattern of, of being and doing. Because if you just keep doing what you've been doing, most likely you're going to keep being what you've been being. We've got to break the pattern in our lives. And one of the ways we want to help break the pattern is to introduce this little tool. It's a prayer journal. It says on the front, I believe in Jesus, but... And, and the, the exercises in here are meant to help us break the pattern so that we can, can become doers of the word, so that we become activists in this world. And in here are, are uh, pages with scriptures on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side as a way of communing or hearing God and also listening to him about what he wants us to do. And there are four steps to this. Read, reflect, pray, and wait. And we're going to do this together real quickly. And, and on one of the days of this week, it's the second day of this first week, there's a scripture, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it's just a very common scripture. And we're going to read this together. And we're going to practice and walk through the steps of this together here this morning. So I want you to get comfortable. In a place of, I want to hear God right now. We're going to read this scripture a couple of times. And then we're going to walk through this together. Let's read Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'll read this to you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers... And sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his holy, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, the first step in this uh, communing process, this hearing process with God, is to read the passage and ask the question, what stands out to you? Now we're going to read it again, a little slower, and I want you to ask this question, what stands out to you as we read this? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're just going to take about 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, just to ask ourselves the question, what stands out? as we read this passage. This is the third time I've led people through this exercise this weekend. And each time God has pointed out, or I felt, or, or something stood out to me that was different. This time it was the phrase, this is true worship. Other times it's been something else. And across this room, everybody would have heard or reflected or, or, or something stood out that was different to you. There's, in other words, there's no right answer to this question. As you pray and reflect over this, you're just waiting on the Spirit to speak to you. Because we want, this, this whole process is based on the belief that God can speak to everyone here. And that God is bigger than your problem, that God is bigger than your sin, that God is bigger than whatever you're in right now, that God can speak to you. And we're using the word of God to do that. So the first step was read the passage and ask the question, what stands out to you? The second step is to reflect on this point. So whatever stood out to you, you reflect on it. And you ask the question, what comes to mind as you reflect on this passage? So we're going to take a few seconds here, about 15 seconds, for you just to reflect on... What stood out to you? Just kind of let that ruminate in your mind. As I was briefly reflecting on what God, I felt like God was speaking to me, I began to think about a lot of the things that I think are true worship aren't really worship at all. And, it would begin to, you know, and I could take that and re read back over the scripture if I had a little, more, a, few more, a little more time to think about what is this passage saying to me about what worship is. The next step of this is to pray 
the point. Turn any insight that you have into a prayer. Now, I encourage you to just converse with God. Don't, you don't have to have fancy language in, or, in order to have this kind of prayer conversation with God. You don't have to be a good prayer to do this. In fact, sometimes the best prayers are not good official prayers. Just be honest with God in this. And we're going to take about 10 seconds here just to, just to pray whatever you feel like you were being, whatever you were, have been seeing in this passage. As I was praying this, I just prayed simply, show me what true worship is and make me into that person. Each day, make me into that person. I'm not there yet, God. i got a long way to go. There's nothing special about that kind of praying. It's just real prayer. The last aspect of this is to wait. To wait on God and ask the question, what do you sense God speaking to you? Now, this may be the most difficult aspect of this process for us because each of us has a lot going on in our lives. Each of us is busy. Each of us has a lot of stuff and a lot of noise in our lives. And it, maybe it's time to turn off the t TV for 15 minutes and just wait on God. Maybe it's time to turn off the radio. Maybe it's time to not cook dinner yet. Maybe it's time to get up 15 minutes earlier. Maybe just to do something to carve out a little space in our life to just wait on God and allow the Spirit of God to speak to us. Now, we're not going to do this here because I'm not going to let you off that easy. This is not something we can do in 15 seconds and go, wow, I waited on God. Isn't that great? What kind of relationship would you have with your best friend if you sat and, and listened to him for 15 seconds? God invites us into a relationship with him, and he says, hear and obey. And if we're willing to hear and obey and let that ruminate within us, and we start talking about that with other people. Uh, last night, there was a, a couple of ladies, in, actually in their 70s, and they were talking about how they would use this in their lives. And she said, I'm going to call you every day this week, and we're going to talk about what we're hearing from God. And you start doing that and do that in your small group. Do that with your family. This stuff will start churning within you. And you'll start hearing God more clearly and say, I, I know what I need to do. I know where I need to be involved. I know where I need to be an activist. I know where I need to stand up for the kingdom. And you will stand out with confidence. Instead of just doing something that a preacher tells you to do, you'll do something because you believe in it. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in our, in our world today. And I, our question is, will we, including Greg and I, get involved with that? Because that's what the, the Spirit is doing. Amen. Einstein said... The definition of insanity is having the same input while expecting a different output. Uh, if we keep doing our life the way we've been doing it, our life will just be, as Scott said, be the same kind of life. But God calls us to be continually growing and maturing and developing. And that means we have to carve out space to let God grow us and mature us. Blessed are those who hear and obey. That means we've got to carve out space to hear. And to meditate on. And so what, whether you use the journal or not, I think it's a fantastic tool to begin to put into practice this sort of thing. But make time in your day. A pattern interrupt. Change the pattern, the flow of your life. Uh, to let God talk with you and begin to change you from the inside out. Because the kingdom of God isn't just about doing things. It's about being transformed. And that's why we do different things. We're transformed from the inside out. I want to close in prayer. I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up here uh, as I get ready to do this. And if you're here this morning and you are not living in obedience to Christ, you're not surrendered to Christ, and there's something inside of you that is saying, this is the time to do that, I want you to come forward. These folks would love to talk to you and pray with you about how to get in on with the kingdom revolution that Jesus came to, uh, to, to start. Uh, if you have any other need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come forward and pray with these folks, or you just feel free to kneel at the altar and pray. Maybe God's working on something with you right now. Uh, convicting you perhaps that you've been too much of a spectator. It's time to get in the game. So can we all stand as we close in prayer? And prayer team, would you come up here? And so Father, we thank you, God, that we are, that you have equalized all of us. We all stand before you as sinners saved by grace. 
And uh, we thank you for the various gifts you pour out in this congregation. But we thank you that you alone are Lord God. And our, all, all of our worship and all of our, our admiration is towards you and none other. We pray, Lord God, that you would free us from this culture of voyeurism and spectatorism, Lord God. Uh, convict us if we are ourselves living too much of our life vicariously through what we watch on television or see at the movie theaters or in some other uh, medium. Lord God, free us from that. Uh, and God, free us to be people who live fully alive, not just watch others be fully alive, but God, call us to be fully alive, empower us to be fully alive and engaged and hearing your word and obeying your word as we seek to go out of this place and start living your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said one last time, amen. God bless you guys. Go on and build the kingdom.